So I'm Alicia uh, with Conservation Nebraska's Common Ground Program, and I serve the Southwest region of Nebraska. And we cover a variety of different conservation topics, um, and we try to educate the public on them. And today we have Addie Pernicki with um, Pheasants Forever here with us. Uh, Addie obtained her bachelor's degree in wildlife at Unity College and her master's degree in biology at Kansas State University. Um, she is originally from Maine, and she has enjoyed living in Nebraska since 2012. Her previous work uh, experience focused on ring neck pheasant movement um, behavior and carryover effects of stress. During her master's degree, she focused on benefits of spring cover crops of ring neck um, pheasants while encouraging cover crops and soil health improvement. And today she's gonna talk to us about pollinators and uh, habitats. So, and also I just want to uh, remind everybody that we will have a survey linked at the end of the webinar. Um, if you could please take the survey, it helps us uh, continue programming and see if you enjoyed the webinar. Alrighty, thank you so much for the introduction and we're, ma we're making sure this is recorded, right? I think I see the little button up top. Alrighty, I've been in a lot of Zoom meetings where that doesn't happen. <laughs> Alrighty, so thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to be going over a lot of stuff talking about pollinators, our, the importance of them. We're going to be looking at some native plants. I did a little bit of a tour of, of one of our project areas, um, talking about birds, bluebirds specifically, and then um, some of the programs we have if people are interested in, in potentially providing some wildflower habitat for pollinators and other species. So here we go. A quick overview, like I mentioned, pollinators. We're going to be building a mason bee hotel. I'm going to try to finish mine while we're going through this. Um, some of our common pollinator native plants that we do in our plantings with Peasants Forever and um, other stuff. Um, going over the bluebird boxes, conservation programs, wrap up. The thing I would like to mention is, you know, we want people to just kind of watch and learn. If you want to follow along with the mason bee hotel, please feel free to do, but this is kind of a watch and then maybe do it a little bit later especially with the bluebird box, it is, that is a bit time consuming and you definitely want to have all the safety equipment necessary. Alrighty, so when people think of pollinators, most of the time they just think of butterflies. However, there are a lot more species and a lot of different types of species that encompass that group. We have over a thousand vertebrates. So these are birds, bats, small mammals, our, our pollinators, and then we have over 200,000 invertebrates. So that can be anything from a moth to a bee to a beetle. So there's a whole bunch of diversity in pollinators and some of them are very specific, one species to one type of plant, and some of them are very broad and they use a bunch of different wildflowers that they help pollinate, um, right? A lot of times people don't realize, however, the importance of our pollinators because when you think about it, 75% of flowering plants require some type of pollination by animals and the rest are probably going to be wind pollination. So we really do require pollination by pollinators. If we don't have them, that can be a big problem. Currently about a thousand plants are cultivated um, that require animal pollination in the world. And I know in the US actually it's about 95 and there, there are some big ones. For example, alfalfa, that's a kind of a big one there. So um, how much is it worth, right? So they estimated in 2019 that pollinators alone, the service that they provide to us to give us food was worth $20 billion. And a lot of that is completed <clears throat> by the honeybee that we brought you know, from other countries to help pollinate our plants. Um, and so they're great at pollinating, but there's also native pollinators that we'll be talking about mainly today. Let's see if I can do this. Um, however, we do have some <laughs> issues with our pollinators declining. We have competition from invasive or naturalized species. Maybe we'll see what's going on with those more murder hornets. Um, we do have declining populations. I know a lot of people may be familiar with the iconic monarch. You know, they are migratory species. They come to the United States and in several generations they lay eggs and they move north in the final generation. Usually the fourth one is they fly all the way down to Mexico and they stay there over winter until they repeat that process again. Um, and so they're declining significantly. In the past 20 years, we've seen a, a crash in populations in both East and the West. So 
by trying to provide them as much wildflower and nectar resources as possible, we can help boost those numbers and keep that iconic species with us. Bumblebees, in the past few years, we've had the first time that some uh, pollinators have been listed on the Endangered Species Act here in um, the United States. And so that's a big concern because bumblebees are very important um, for, for pollinating a variety of species, include some, some crops that people use. Um, bat. The uh, species of bat that pollinates the agave plant, which is responsible for tequila, if you love your tequila, was listed um, as uh, threatened or endangered down there in Mexico. So that was a concern to them. And that's something that people should consider as well. It's not just, you know, bees or, or um, your butterflies that are gonna be potentially threatened. It's other species as well that can have a really big impact on some main commercial crops. So now that I've kind of gone over the importance of pollinators, um, what do we have here in Nebraska? Well, it's more than just the honeybee. We have uh, flies, we have butterflies, we have beetles, um, we have wasps, bumblebees, we have a variety of species and um, they are important to our agricultural community. And so a lot of times people think, well, we have honeybees, honeybees aren't doing good. Well, what's really not doing well is actually our native pollinators like you kind of see here in this um, photo frame. And so um, some, a lot of people don't realize that honeybees can actually be quite aggressive when it comes to trying to get nectar and pollen off of flowers. They can actually be kind of push other native pollinators away. And you can see in some of these pictures, I have two or three native pollinators that are sharing one blossom. So a lot of times people can try to think that, oh, well, we're gonna have a beehive and this is gonna help pollinators. Well, you're just helping one specific species. And that's not necessarily a huge negative thing, but um, trying to locate your beehives away potentially from native prairie can really sometimes help and support your other native pollinators. Um, so here is a cool video that I had the other day. I stopped in a ditch and I wanted to show this video of some native pollinators on a milkweed plant. See if this works. So I believe this is a wasp here. It doesn't have a, um, might be a fly, a uh, pollen collector. We have a moth and there's a whole bunch of little um, other bees that are also trying to come and get nectar and pollinating. And then I have one more video. Oops. To the next one here. This is a sphinx moth. They look like hummingbirds. And it's really neat to see them flit around to the different types of flowers and, and work the nectar. It's really cool. Oh. So how can we help our pollinators? Well, there's a variety of things we can do um, that are really easy to accomplish. So one of the things they've found some research that even if you delay mowing your yard for two weeks, that'll help some of the clover species that you may have in your mix come up and provide nectar to a variety of, of species. And so that can be something that, you know, it, you don't need to let your grass get 10 inches tall, but even just letting it get just a little bit higher so you have some more flowers showing up can really help your native pollinators if you're in kind of a residential area. Um, a lot of times people really want to have butterflies but they forget if you go ahead and you spray pesticides especially when they have young on the landscape <clears throat> um, you're going to kill those. So if you can try to avoid using pesticides if possible and if necessary kind of target in very small locations so that you're not going to influence any of those other really good uh, pollinators that we have. Um, so we can definitely try to give them some food by planting wildflowers. Some of our most important early flowering species are shrubs, like plum thickets that we have here. So if you can provide that for them, that would be a huge bonus to these species and really increase what we have on the landscape as habitat for them. Um, some other things you can do is you should leave, if you can, like woody stem materials or um, areas of, of sandy ground. We have a lot of species of bumblebees that actually will be tunneling in and making cavities for their young in the ground. And if you have a lot of compost or stuff on top, they can't actually get down or it gets weighted down and the larva can't get up. So um, 
if you can provide some areas of sandy ground and then have some like leftover stems from last year that are kind of pithy that they can, um, like for example, mason bees can tunnel in and, and lay their larva, um, that would be really great. And you can also provide bee hotels. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. We have two types we're kind of going to go over today. And, and those are really great to kind of provide additional nesting resources when there are not many potentially in the area that you want to encourage them to come to. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about building these mason bee hotels. There are over 300 species of mason bees and they come in a variety of, of black, green, and blue colors. Um, they're cavity nesting, so they're going to go in and they're going to lay eggs in here and they're going to come up here and they're going to seal the end. And each one of these is going to be like almost a little compartment that has pollen. And as the egg hatches and eats the pollen, it's going to develop and then it's going to overwinter in these tubes and then come out a de developed as a mason bee the next year. Um, there's actually other species too. The, um, there's carter bees and leaf cutter bees. Carter bees are the ones that are going to like, they're going to go and get um, the hairy material, I believe, off of leaves and twigs. And that's what they're going to use to line their nests. And then you have leaf cutters, which as you anticipate, they go and they cut leaves and they make those part of their nests. So I kind of have pictures here of all the different types. And um, as you can see, the carter bees are kind of a striped yellow. And then the, um, we have a bunch of different colors. Um, there's, a there's a variety of species that have been introduced um, to pollinate. I believe the blue orchard bee is one. Um, so there's a bunch of different and neat small bees that are going to be using these tunneling like materials to nest and lay their eggs. So if you're trying to learn something new and have fun building a bee house, this is kind of the steps that we're going to go through. So first of all, you want to get all of your materials. Um, so you're going to need newspaper. Those are going to be your initial tubes. However, we don't just want to use newspaper. We're going to also want to use um, uninked pieces of paper that haven't been treated. So something like a white little piece of paper like this. And we're going to need some tape. We're going to need something to roll the paper up in. So like a piece of pen or you could use a paintbrush or a larger marker because these guys come in a variety of sizes. And then scissors, of course, and some twine, and then um, potentially a, a bracket um, and some screws if you wanted to mount it. So that's what we're gonna do. So first we're gonna get all our materials. Then we're gonna roll our little pieces of paper. I've got a whole bunch that are already rolled. I'm still working to fill my little paper tubes with um, some additional uninked paper. And I might do that as we go along. But once you've got all of your little paper newspaper tubes ready, then you're going to roll your remaining <clears throat> um, non-inked paper. And that's going to take some time. I'm not going to lie. It takes a little bit and it really helps if you have kids and you all want to work on one together and you all can just work to get that done as quick as possible. Or you can just have separate ones and, and just kind of take your time and enjoy kind of how this all goes together. So is once you get the um, paper newspaper and the non-inked paper all rolled up, you're going to put it in there and you're going to tape the ends of the tube shut, at least one of the ends so that we don't have parasites that can get in and eat the babies. And then step four is you're going to put your duct tape with your twine on your can and um, so you can hang it. Another option that I'll mention I think I put in here, there we go, is if you wanted to instead of hanging it, um, to mount it on a post, you should probably use a bracket. So this is an example of a elbow shaped bracket that I got at just a basic hardware store and some self driving screws. And you just attach it. For me, I had decided to attach it to the bottom because I didn't want potentially any rain that would leak in. And um, you can just mount that about at least three feet off of the ground um, in kind of a shaded spot. So, um, so we're going to try to face these south southeast. We don't want them to be in a too hot area. You're going to slightly tip them down, not enough for the little tubes to fall out, but enough that um, if there was any water that did get trapped in, it could get out. Um, we're going to have it, like I said, at least three feet off the ground. And if you can, place it near pollinator plants, right? Because these uh, little 
females that are going to be laying these eggs are going to want to go and put their eggs in a place where they know that there's going to be food for their babies next year. So um, try to focus. If you're going to have a little pollinator house, try your best to place it near near native wildflowers. Alrighty. Um, Elysia, did we have any questions in the chat? This was kind of a good place to stop before I go into the next one. Um, we don't have any questions in the chat right now, but if anybody does have questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A portion. I was gonna see if maybe people had texted me because I did put my number. I'm not sure where my phone disappeared to. So. <laughs> so we did get a question um, from Sarah. Uh, she said, will wasps take over the houses? Yeah, so we do actually have a variety of native wasps, kind of like I mentioned prior to, and the majority of them are actually not bad. They're good and they are important for keeping down um, the insect populations in total. So sometimes you do see some wasps, but don't be concerned. Parasitic wasps, you know, that's uh, a little bit I was gonna talk about later on about cleaning equipment. Um, they can be an issue, especially um, sometimes when we're trying to provide bee hotels, people get really excited and they put a lot of them up. Well, with anything, and especially what we've noticed with, noticed with COVID-19, if you put everybody together, diseases and parasites are going to proliferate. So if you, what you want to do is try to place your hotels, if you have multiple, kind of a little bit apart so that you're not drawing a bunch of those parasites in. And um, you know, taking over that house. Uh, there was a study that came out that looked at the different composition of species that were using um, residential bee houses, and a lot of them were wasps, but they were actually good native wasps that weren't parasites. Mm -hmm. um, and then Jan asked, do you ever need to clean out the bee house? Yeah, so I'm gonna go over that after I talk about the next one. Okay. But yes, um, I guess I could talk about that right now. So the what you're going to have is that you're going to have these newspaper tube linings, and then um, what you're going to want to do is remove the, the paper insert one. I guess I have. And if you think the other one is really dirty, or you notice that there might be insects or parasites in there, you can also just throw away this one. The whole idea with this is that it's disposable, so you can just start again next year, nice and clean, clean and fresh, without any diseases in there to influence your new crop of mason bees. Okay, um, and then Olivia and Eli asked, um, when you roll the paper, do you put the white paper inside the newspaper? Yes, you do. Yeah, I originally, there has been, I've read some articles where it's okay to use newspaper. I've read some articles where it's not. And so I think to be safe, newspaper is treated, um, so stuff doesn't eat it. And um, stuff, meaning insect and other species. So what we want to do is provide them with the best non-toxic scenario where you can just you know, it takes a little bit more time, but um, you can roll newspaper and this is gonna be kind of your firm tube. You can also use cardboard um, to, for your actual tubes. They're a little firmer, takes a little bit more to get the tape to stick sometimes, but um, they're a little um, easier also to just put your paper in tube inserts because they're gonna retain more of a round shape. Um, but yeah, we're gonna wanna put non-inked paper into that tube that you're creating. Right. It looks like you can go ahead and continue. We don't have. All right. So this is just one kind of easier type of bee hotel that you can do with very basic um, materials. There is another type. These are great pictures from the UNL extension about uh, using a wooden block to create a bee house. And they, you know, they have some suggestions on sizes, but really anything that's probably going to be six by six or larger. Um, is going to be, or six by eight or larger, is going to be what's great for these um, pollinators. So this is kind of the same concept. They're going to be going into these holes you're creating and um, laying eggs. And this is, I love the middle picture here. It shows a variety of different species that are using these, these houses that they've created. And there's a great example of a bee hotel. Now, like I said, you know, that is an option that you can do. That's a lot of bee hotels in one area. And so we want to kind of reduce how many we have so that we're kind of limiting how many parasites and diseases can be transmitted. Um, but they give, uh, I sent the, I, hopefully everybody got it, but I sent out a email with this paper talking about how you can drill it, the different species that you'll be expected to see. They kind of have a whole uh, diameter example here over on the left. 
with the expected species of bees that you can see. So I'm kind of just going to talk through that very briefly. It's, it's very simple to make. Um, it just takes a little bit of elbow grease. So first of all, you're going to want to also have liners in this because we're going to remove those liners and want to wash the flock later on. But we're just going to have your basic supplies. You will need a power drill and you will need a, a drill bits of specific sizes that were mentioned depending on what species you're trying to, to encourage to be in this house. I like to just mark where I'm going to drill and then making sure I have safety glasses and all the other protection necessary. Just go ahead and drill into that block at least six inches deep for some of your larger holes. It can be five to three inches for some of your smaller diameter, diameter drill bits. Um, and then just roll up some non-ink paper and place inside um, in step two, like I showed here, inside your, um, your house. And at some point, you're going to see where the females come, and they're going to cover over those tubes so you don't see them. Um, so, you, so the larvae are protected and nothing in theory can get in. But we're going to make sure to um, tape the end of that paper tubes. We know that if something was going to move along the outside, it can't get in the other end and start eating those. Um, so this kind of incorporates what I said before, um, but a little bit more information about maintenance and, and how the process works. So usually, it's unfortunate we're making these now because it's kind of behind times, but usually what you're going to do is you're going to take your bee hotels and you're going to leave them out starting in April. Um, you're going to see that females have gone in there, laid their eggs, and like I said, they're going to cap that paper tube. So this is going to be, you're going to pull your tube out and you're going to see that it's capped. And you're going to bring inside for winter and you're going to put it in a cool dry location. Um, you're going to take the paper inserts out and I would suggest putting them in like a brown bag or a cardboard box that has some holes in it. And once spring starts to come, you're going to place that cardboard box in a dry spot outside and over, you know, between April and July, sometimes a little sooner than that, maybe June, those new mason bees are going to emerge from this tube and they're going to be able to get out from the box that you've created um and the holes in the box and the reason you put it in the box is because you don't want them to think that they should come back and nest in that nesting block because it's dirty right it has diseases it might have parasites so once you have confirmed they've all left you can even you know open and check the tubes um you're gonna throw <laughs> throw out the paper and um you're gonna create a new one for next season now that's why a lot of people like to have two of the blocks um you know, I had two that I was working on so that you can have one that you set out so that um, you can have for next year and then one that you have right now. And if, if you do this whole process, you have two you can place out. But some people like to just not necessarily um, go in and move around the paper inserts. They like to just leave them in there, put them outside in a cardboard box where the you know, new mason bees can get out and then still provide habitat with another box later on. A lot of times the new females will come back to that same area to try to nest. So try to put your box where they're gonna escape out of in the similar location that you have your new, um, your new box with the new clean paper inserts out. Um, like I said, maintenance, we're gonna wanna wash and remove any debris or parasites from that uh, box and throw out the, the paper linings that you had and put in new linings for next year. Um, so yeah, that's a good stopping point. Do we have any questions? Um, so somebody asked, can you show the pictures of the hole sizes again? Yeah. And this is recorded, so if you guys want to rewatch it, I, I, I sometimes rewatch webinars to get information. So here are the diameter holes, and I kind of show it like this. Here. So I was planning on targeting kind of a larger one and doing some kind of half inch holes. This is one that I haven't drilled yet. Um, for the other one that I drilled in the past, it was a smaller diameter holes. Was that long enough for everybody to see? I also sent that out in an email. So if anyone has any additional or ha did not get that email with this um, paper information from the UNL extension about solitary bee houses, please email me and I'll make sure to get that to you. It doesn't look like we have any other questions right now. All righty. How am oh, I doing on time? Because I can't see. You're doing good on time. Actually, we just got um, from Sarah again. If you, if there, if it is a permanent structure like the one on the right, how do you clean it? Like the so yeah. So what's permanent about this structure is that just the outline. So the, the actual what's holding those boxes is in 
is connected to that pole, but the boxes can be pulled out. So you can actually pull those boxes out. So you're not actually fixing them to that box. Now with like this block, I might do that and you could unscrew it from a pole or I could create a structure to protect it from heat and rain. Um, so I, for example, I have a deck out back that's covered and it's dry, so no rain can get in and I'd probably just set this up on the railing um, near, nearby where I knew it wouldn't get blown off and damaged and then bring it inside or to a cool location in my garage where it's gonna remain dry all winter and um, then have it put in a cardboard box with some holes so that the bees can get out in the spring. Okay. All right. All right, are we good to go? Yeah. Okay. So this is an example of a, a project that I worked, well, one of my previous um, coworkers worked on. And so I'm just gonna play this video and, and it'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing. So I am standing here on a Corners for Wildlife project that is funded through Pheasants Forever and Partners. This targets pivot corners. So we're on a pivot corner right now next to some corn. And as you can see, there are quite a few flowers blossoming. So this is pretty exciting to see this. I'm just gonna talk about a few of them here. So to start off, we have Mexican hat, this red one here, the type of cone flower. We also have yarrow, this is that white one, an important early blossoming species. We also have blanket flower. And we have a non-native that people use a lot, this is alfalfa. This pretty blue one is also kind of an early flower, that's flax, it's kind of starting to go by. And then we also have black-eyed Susan and you can see there's a pollinator on it right now. There's a lot more flowering. We have primrose in here. We also have yellow sweet clover. It's also a non-native that people use a lot. And this is what we would call a brood mix. It's very focused on wildflowers and herbaceous plants. So about 75% of the mix is gonna compose of that and the other 25% is gonna be grasses. And this is really good because it provides a lot of insects for the chicks to eat, such as pheasant chicks or quail chicks, or even dick sizzle chicks. I can hear dick sizzle singing in the background. That's a prairie species of bird. And uh, bluebirds can also benefit from this. If there was some cavity nesting locations available, they would kind of just put their nest there and come and feed in this area, get insects for their chicks. So there you go. Alrighty, yeah, so that was really exciting to see all those flowers out there um, and see, you can kind of see butterflies as well as other things flying around. Um, that was pretty fun. And I actually, when I was walking through that field, because I didn't just stop there, I ended up flushing some pheasant chicks and there was a, a rooster pheasant nearby crowing. I didn't get to see him though, I think he ran away, but it was really neat to see all that wildlife out there. So, oh. I keep doing that. So when we talk about some of our native pollinator plants, some of the stuff that we like to use in our planting mixes um, are, are through, a, they flower through a variety of seasons. So we have plants that'll flower in the early part of the season and provide pollinator habitat and um, you know, forage for insects and other things like that for, for chicks. And then we also have the majority of our plantings when it comes to species diversity is gonna be in June and July. So that's kind of your mid season. Um, blooming species and then we also have a late season species. So uh, a lot of times when th people think of goldenrod, we have a lot of late season blossoming plants. And recently they found that goldenrod was especially important for mo migratory monarchs. So when they're mig migrating back down to Mexico, um, goldenrod was really important for them to keep them going and make it safely home. So Maximilian sunflower is another fun one we like to use. It's very tall, very, very prolific, especially back east, where we are out here in the western part of the state. We like to use it a lot because no matter what, especially if we have some like invasive cool season grasses or non-native cool season grasses like cheatgrass or brome, we know Maximilian sunflower is going to come up. And so that's really a fun yellow one to see late in the fall. You might see it along the road ditches or in some of our conservation reserve 
um, fields, also known as CRP. So that's a fun one we like to incorporate in our mixes. Um, one of the, some of the plants that I talked about in the video, I incorporated here just in case the video didn't work. So yarrow, that is an early blossoming species. Um, it comes in a variety of colors. It can come from white to pink, light purple. And that's a one that is a perennial and it's going to be there um, almost every year. It's gonna come up and be very useful for those early pollinating um, insects to get some nectar. So flax, this is, I love flax because it's one of the few blue flowers that we have. And um, it, it is more in the early part of the season, kind of mid-June now we're getting into them starting their flowers to go away. I and mean, that's a fun, vibrant one you'll see in the ditches a lot too when you're driving on the highway. Hori vervain is another important pollinator, and it's this lovely purple flower here on the left. And you'll see that a lot in pastures. You'll see it in our CRP plantings and our native wildflower plantings. It's a fun one, and it's important. Um, I had another video that I didn't include, actually, of some butterflies that were all over a bunch of Hori vervain that I found, so that was pretty neat. Uh, Mexican hat is a type of cone flower, and you see it a lot. In, and you'll see it in a lot in the mix and it's very vibrant and has a, a bunch of different colors. Sometimes it can be more of like a mix between red and yellow and so it comes in a variety of different colors and it's really fun. Blank flower, another good one here and that's going to be more in your um, kind of loamier soils and um, it's a great very colorful one. It comes in both red and like red with tinged color. So it, it's really good to see out in the plantings. I was excited to see so much of it actually. Um, primrose, there's multiple species of primrose and um, they are also very, very good things to have in your, your native pollinator garden. Um, there's some species that are more used to sandy locations than not sandy locations. So if you're in an area that has different types of soils, whether you're sandy soils or loamy soils, definitely try to talk to someone who knows about wildflower planting so that we can help you work with species that are gonna be good for your site. Rosin weed is another fun one that you don't see as often, but is also important. Um, and then we also have gray head coneflower. I like to see this around a lot. Um, I, I'll see it, actually yesterday I saw a bunch in a native pasture. So that was really exciting to see that flowering and they come in these gorgeous yellow colors and it's, a, it's another type of coneflower. So naturalized species that we also see, um, it's very common to see this actually planted in CRP mixes. This is alfalfa on the left and then that purple one and then we have yellow sweet clover as well. And there's also another type of sweet clover called white sweet clover um, that people plant that it's very po popular with the native pollinators coming, uh, um, lots of nectar available for them. So those are just some examples of a few types of wildflowers that you could incorporate into your garden and keep in mind when you're trying to pr produce you know wildflowers for species you want to have stuff blooming in the early part of the season and in the later part of the season because that's incorporated for a whole you know time frame of lifespans for for different types of species you know some species are going to be focused more on the summer some are going to need it in the fall like the monarchs so definitely something to con something to consider uh, when you're trying to create a pollinator garden, you're going to want to locate a sunny spot that's going to have, you know, good producing soil that you can make sure you can get water to. Um, it's not necessarily required. A lot of these, these are just growing without being watered or irrigated, but, you know, we do have droughts in Nebraska, so if you need to get water to it, it would definitely be useful. Ground preparation is key. You're going to want to make sure you till that soil and try to remove any um, non-native or invasive or just non-target -species, species that you don't want. And um, sometimes people, if you have an issue with like smooth brome or cheatgrass, you can spray, but I would encourage you to spray and then wait a period before planting. Um, Cause that is um, sometimes certain types of spray can influence the uh, native wildflowers and their ability to germinate. Um, so with annual maintenance, you're just gonna wanna make sure you go in and remove, like I said, any non-native species, anything that might be taking over your garden that isn't flowering like grasses. And then if you want, you can try to provide your uh, pollinators, some bee houses, as well as some locations where they can potentially get water because it's hot here and that's definitely something that can help their, them in their daily lives. So I'm going to now go on to bluebirds. Alicia, does anyone have any questions about wildflowers? So we did get a question um, and this one was about the bee hotel actually. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, so will these not overwinter safely outside the B hotels? Um, it's potentially that they will. The only concern I would have is the amount of moisture we may get. Um, so it's a lot of times if you really want to make sure that you're going to protect all the mason bees that you've helped create with that hotel, just the simple act of taking it inside would really potentially increase the survivability um, of those, especially when we're using things like paper inserts that can get moldy. And Alicia, how am I doing on time? You're good on time. Alrighty, great. Uh, it looks so, like we Say that again? Uh, we did get another question. Mm -hmm. um, is there a place to get seeds to grow the pollinator flowers? Yes, there's a variety of um, native plant um, producers in the state, seed vendors. And uh, if anyone's interested, they can email me and I can provide them a list. Um, so there's a bunch of different seed vendors around that have a quite a, it's, it's a gigantic list of species that are very specific to different regions in the state. We have three different types of prairies in Nebraska and the closer, so if we're close to Colorado, we're looking at um, the short grass prairie because there's not as much rain. When you get kind of further into where we're at here in North Platte and a little bit further east, we have what we call the mis mixed grass prairie. So it has short grass species and then kind of tall grass species. And then when we go a bit further west, uh, excuse me, east, we have the, what we call the tall grass prairies. So that's gonna be a lot of different species that require different amounts of water pretty much is what it breaks down to. And it's, and it's not just grass species, it's wildflower species as well. That's why Maximilian sunflower does so good back east because it can really do well with a lot of water um, and why we don't see as much of it out here, but it's a good amount that we see. So there's a variety of vendors around. Um, and you can also go online and there is actually quite a few organizations that uh, provide seed for free if you're trying to do pollinator gardens. Um, I'll talk about some of the programs we have later, especially with Pheasants Forever on that. Oh. Okay. Yeah, and that was all the questions for now. So. Alrighty, so bluebirds, um, primarily we're gonna be seeing the Eastern bluebird in Nebraska. Uh, they are kind of an iconic species that love to live in kind of open areas with a few trees and shrubs. And the important thing about bluebirds is that they help maintain uh, the health of our ecosystem. So they're able to consume insects so they don't get out of control, as well as the habitats that they use are great for pollinators and other species. So, um, and they're just so gorgeous to see. I love to see them flying around. They have gorgeous songs. Um, the concern that we have is, is when we had some of the invasive species get introduced, we started to see a decline because the invasive species were taking over their cavity nesting locations. So right now, our population is doing pretty good in Nebraska, but we can continue to improve it by providing cavity nesting structures for them in areas of, of quality habitat where you have an open location that might not have any trees nearby. So by putting a bluebird house up it can really increase their ability to use that area. So that's kind of how we talk about how we're helping with our bluebird. So the main culprits are our European house sparrow, especially in towns, and our European starling. And both of these birds I think are pretty. The problem we have is that they're both cavity nesting species and they're a bit more aggressive about it and taking over than bluebirds are. There's even been um, recordings of house sparrows actually attacking and killing bluebirds and killing their babies. So if we can limit the exposure in the locations that we put these boxes so that they're not necessarily in a residential area, bluebirds aren't necessarily gonna be in a residential area, they're gonna be out, out in the country. So try to make sure when you're placing these nest boxes, you think about what's nearby. For example, I'm renting a, a house right now that has several, um, Purple Martin houses, and unfortunately, we have a lot of house sparrows nearby that have tried to take over. So that's a constant battle that you fight with. Um, and people manage it in different ways, you know, using lethal methods or trap and re release. But uh, in the end, placement, especially with those bluebird boxes, is going to be the key thing to kind of removing some of these from the area. In addition, um, if anyone picked up kits for North Platte that I made, I made the holes. The entrance holes were a di an inch and a half diameter, and that is going to be too small for a starling to get into. A house sparrow can still get in, but if you're kind of removing your box from a residential area, you're going to have a lot 
less chance of house sparrows taking it. And these species are, are were introduced from Europe. Um, I believe the story is there was a gentleman who wanted, I think, all the species from a Shakespeare poem or something like that in the United States. And well, this is what we have. And it, it's always going to be an issue that we'll have to be managing. So, and we're going to start our bluebird construction. Safety equipment. You always want to do safety first. I was wearing my glasses the whole time, um, as well as ear protection, because those saws that we're going to be using, power saws, are very loud. Um, so I kind of sent a list of the things that we're going to be needing. You're going to be needing a uh, four, so a, a one inch by six inch diameter, four foot long board. And you're going to go ahead and you're going to measure that board out into different um, widths. I provided a, a list in the email about the different types of measurements that we're going to need. Um, if you did not get that email with the information, please let me know. But it's going to be one piece is going to be the floor. It's going to be about four inches wide. And then you're going to have two sides that are going to be about 12 inches tall. The front is going to be 10 inches tall. And then you're going to have the back, which is going to be 12 inches tall. And then you're going to have the roof, which is going to be a 10 inch, a one by 10 inch wide board that's 12 inches long. Alrighty, so you're going to go and you're going to measure and cut all that. Um, I think when I was getting down to cutting it, I was going really quickly and I could do like cut it all up in about five to 10 minutes, but take your time and be safe. You know, there is no rushing to get this done. This is just something fun that you can do um, on a weekend, on an evening night that you can help wildlife. So this is kind of what it's gonna look like when it's all cut up. You have your floor, the front of your house, your two sides, the back and the roof. Um, some of the things you'll need for the next stage is gonna be drills and a spade bit. If you haven't drilled the front of the house or you didn't get a kit. Um, if you're gonna be looking at doing anything with like mountain bluebirds, they're gonna require a little bit larger hole size and the um, paper that I sent out with the attachment um, details what size you'll need. So I use the spade bit. You could also use a hole saw. Um, that's also an option, but we're going to be looking here at a half inch diameter drill. I'd be a three sixteenths diameter drill and a one eighth inch diameter drill bit, excuse me. And you'll need a power drill to do this. So you can kind of see here, the next step I did was I went and I marked and measured where I was going to drill. So I'm going to drill inside with the 1 8 um, drill bit so that the wood isn't gonna crack when I go ahead and drill. And then just on the outside boards, I'm gonna drill the 3 16 so the screws can get in easily. Um, I did first, the first box I made, I didn't drill at all and it split a lot. Um, it, it was a bit sad. So once I started drilling, like they suggest in the actual instructions, it worked, went a lot better. Um, and this was kind of the end result, this is the box that, the good box, I should say, that I made. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that too. The next step, like I said, is you're just gonna drill your holes. You can see here, those are the outside boards that I drilled. Uh, I think I have a picture later about it. And then once you have all your, your holes drilled, you're gonna start to um, use your screws and you're gonna screw in your wood. Um, I use all purpose screws. You could also use deck screws if you want. They're uh, one and five eighths inch. Um, and they seem to work really well and, and uh, to get the job done. So yeah, here's an example of like an interior um, um, drill hole with a one eighth inch um, drill bit. And so, you know, you start where you feel comfortable Personally, I, I like to start with a side or with the back, and then I do the floor. So it's easier for me to kind of um, visualize it that way. But you could start with the front if you like. Keep in mind, you're not gonna be screwing all the sides in. One of them is gonna be a moving side so that we can monitor the bluebirds later on. And so you're gonna wanna make sure you don't screw all the pieces in. Like for example, this is my moving side. And I have a nail to kind of keep it in. I'll show pictures of that in a bit. Um, but it moves open. So I did not screw both sides. I only screwed one, one side down for the roof. And you can put more than two screws in, but I, this was pretty steady. So I was able to just go with two screws there. Alrighty. 
very important step. You need to make sure that you either cut shallow pieces into the inside part of the um, entrance, or I took just the spade bit and I uh, dragged it across to create some edge so that the chicks, when they are going to fledge, they're going to fly up and they're going to be able to crawl up the inside and get out the end. And so that's very important to do and try not to forget that because you don't want them to be trapped inside after you've raised them this whole time and successfully tried to help them live. So um, yeah, so this is just step eight. You're gonna just start um, screwing all those pieces into your drill holes. This is an example of the um, moving side that I did. So in the instructions, it shows to do two, um, two whole pivoting screws. Now, if you're gonna do two, I did one. The reason I did one is it's very, it can be difficult. You have to line this up exactly if this is going to pivot, okay? So that's why I chose to do one because it was steady enough. I know this isn't gonna blow out. It, you can kind of hear it snap into place when I, it's done. Um, so if you want to do two, you can, but it's okay also if you feel like this isn't going to blow away that you can do two or just one, excuse me. And um, you're gonna drill a 3 16th um, drill bit all the way through the outside as well as this board. And we're gonna use this to kind of keep it shut with this double headed nail. Let's see that, going like that, to keep it closed. So you can check on them every now and then. So, huh, that's interesting. So now that we have um, all that done, I was originally not going to put any um, holes in the top to kind of help with ventilation, but I decided to after the fact. If you were going to do that, I would suggest doing it beforehand. Luckily, I didn't break anything when I was using that half inch size drill bit to make those holes. Um, but yeah, I decided to do it after the fact. I think they came out pretty well. When that's done, all it takes is, is two or three screws to put the top on, kind of line it up so that you have about two inches on each side. And they say about, um, you know, three to six inches in the front. Um, now, something to consider is make sure you've measured everything correctly. I was using some leftover pieces and I didn't realize that until after the fact that I had a little bit of less than 12 inches at the top. So what I could have done is I could have moved this piece up a little bit because I did ing ingress the floor here. I put this up about three quarters of an inch. Um, what I'd probably do if I was going to use this house, which I will likely, is I'm just gonna make a little, I think it's like a half inch piece and drill that in there. So I know that there isn't any predators that could get in the back or any excess water since this roof in the back didn't hold, uh, hasn't covered as much. Um, but that's what it's gonna kind of look like in the end there. There's the bottom, whoop, I lost the nail. Um, if you can, with that drill hole for the nail, try to angle it down so it's not gonna fall out if you have a big piece. Um, something you can do is you can paint the exterior of the house with some weatherproofing material. If you're gonna do that, make sure that you wait a few days before you put it out since some of it can be a little toxic. Try not, don't paint the insides ever and um, avoid painting kind of like the front of the box because that sometimes seems to deter the bluebirds. Um, you're going to place these nests, like I said, or these boxes in an area that's open that would have a lot of insects for these birds to feed on. And uh, don't be discouraged if they don't show up right away, or if you have, let's say, um, some type of swallow come and use them. They're also cavity nesters, and that does happen. What people generally do if they do have swallows is they can, um, you can close the box off until bluebirds show up and then open the box, or I've seen people put two boxes side by side where one's facing this way and one's facing this way. And since both swallows and bluebirds are territorial, you'll have space for both since it takes about, you know, 200 feet, I think, in either direction before another bluebird would come and use that area. The males, this is a picture of a male, are, can be quite territorial. Um, I know that on my family farm up in Maine, we've got, my father just told me two groups that are nesting and one is like way down in the field and he's got bluebirds boxes lined up on each fence post almost. And he's got one group way down in the field and one way up at my grandmother's trailer. So 
um, having bluebird boxes spaced out in quality habitat is good. Um, if you keep having uh, house wrens using your box, if you enjoy house wrens, that's great. If you keep having them use your box, um, it's probably because you've placed your box near too much shrubby material. Like house wrens like a lot of shrubs. So avoid placing them near too many shrubs. Um, place it more out in the open. So you're gonna wanna um, try to clean these boxes out and, and make sure that they're, you know, you're taking anything that might be bad in there out so that the birds can come back and enjoy it next year. Um, there is some great information that I provided about monitoring and having your bluebird box and taking care of it. Um, you're gonna be, if you want, there's organizations in the state I believe it's bluebirds across Nebraska. There's also the um, Nebraska blue or the the Society for Bluebirds, and um, I'll come to that name. But uh, it they have a lot of information about how you can monitor and actually share your information and get the uh, the stuff for providing information on how many chicks you actually fledge, and they can use that to do some research and see how our Nebraska bluebird numbers are doing. Um, if you've noticed you have issues with snakes or uh, other mammals getting into your box and eating eggs or eating chicks, there are predator exclusion devices available. I didn't send out any of that stuff because I didn't, wouldn't have time to do it today. But um, if you have any questions on that, I'm happy to provide information. And um, there's, there's things that you can do where you could, if you have your bluebird box on a pole, you can provide a metal round shape around it so stuff can't get up really good to help keep the snakes out. You can also do like a stove pipe method. So there's a bunch of stuff out there that can help make these boxes really safe. Alrighty, so that's kind of a stopping point for bluebird boxes. Sorry, that was a lot. Um, any questions? Yeah, so um, a couple questions and comments. So Linda said that she put up her first blue box, uh, bluebird box and now they have babies. Oh, great. Um, and then Jan said, how do you, how can you discourage starlings from being in your yard? In your yard? <clears throat> yeah. Um, that's very difficult to do because they just are going to be utilizing a whole, whole bunch of stuff. The best thing you can do is if you have them near your bluebird box is to make sure that whole diameter size is small. If you have a purple martin house, I, I don't know if people do or not, they have these little structures that are kind of like crescent shaped that go over the top of the hole that'll also keep the starlings out. Um, starlings aren't necessarily really that aggressive when it comes to if there's like a bluebird box around, if, if those birds are going to use it. So um, as long as you are keeping them out of your nesting material, you should be. And then Christy said um, measure thrice, cut once, and then. Um, she had a question. So will the swallows and bluebirds or other birds not argue over territory? And that's why you put boxes back to back? Yeah, so they are, they don't, because they're not the same species. If you think about it, if all species each cared about what other species had for, for the areas that they lived in the little territories, there would be like very few overlapping, right? You wouldn't see any butterflies using the same um, plant as a bee. So a lot of times these species don't care as long as there's not a terrible competition going on. So since bluebirds and and, and, and swallows eat different things, um, they're not competing and so they can nest nearby and be, you know, kind of safe and still have a good population in the area. So that's what I've seen. You know, a lot of times people, if they're just constantly de dealing with swallows, they, they keep their houses inside. I've seen this with purple martin houses too. They'll keep the houses inside, and then um, once the bluebirds show up, then they'll put the house outside to make sure that they allow time for that bluebird to get there to use that house. Yeah. Um, and then Linda asked, "Do the boxes that you buy from the um, on the market have marks inside for the birds to climb up and fly out?" You would have. I think everyone is a little bit different. Um, I've seen where they have like three rows that they've cut shallowly in. I was worried about cutting mine in half because it's only, you know, they say that it's an inch wide, um, but it's actually more like three quarters of an inch. And I just get concerned that I was going to cut it in half and then I wouldn't have anything to go on from the front of my box. So I just added, um, I've seen where you can just, you know, take, you know, a, a nail or, you know, a drill bit and just really hard <clears throat> make some edges for those chicks to climb up but you would have to make sure that the commercial box 
that you purchase does. And you might be able to just feel inside of it or even see if there's a description about it on the, the label. Okay, um, and that's all the questions we have for right now. Okay. Alrighty, so um, there was a question about um, what was available for seed and also like I mentioned there's a bunch of vendors just in Nebraska alone and of course across the United States that sell native flower and grass seed that people can use specific to pollinators. Um, however, some of the larger scale stuff since we are in an agricultural community and I wanted to talk about it, um, the way it works with my position, I'm a farm bill biologist and I'm or farm bill wildlife biologist and I'm located here in North Platte and I work for Pheasants Forever. However, it is a partnership with the Natural Resource Conservation Service, the NRCS, which is part of the USDA. So I work in an NRCS office and people come in and they say, hey, I've got some land that's highly erodible. I can't grow corn on it anymore. Is there something I can do? And so I help them find different programs that would fit for them um, that can stop those issues that they're having with soil as well as benefit wildlife. And so one of the main programs that we use, it's through the Farm Service Agency, which is the other program in the USDA. Um, and it's called the Conservation Reserve Program or CRP. We also have the Conservation Reserve Easement Program, which is for irrigated cropland. Um, and we provide kind of just, we have a bunch of different practices that people can pick from just from your basic, like I just want to put grass out there and call it good. Or we have different practices like our pollinator practice is a, what we call a conservation practice 42 or a CP42. Um, we can go out there and say, okay, we'll put in, um, I think right now we look, usually it's about five to 10 acres of this and um, it's gonna be very similar to the picture in the lower screen. It's gonna be very much focused on wildflowers with just a few grasses. And um, those contracts are usually about 10 years long. And so it's a contract with a fire service agency and they have to maintain that as pollinator habitat for those 10 years. And they are provided a payment every year and they also are provided cost share for putting in that practice. So for for drilling the seed, you know, for preparing the field for the seed and for purchasing the seed, there's cost share available with FSA. So if anyone's inter interested in that program, please let me know. Um, you know, we can do this on very small scale and also somewhat larger scale um, fields. And it doesn't necessarily just have to be, um, you know, in, in an ag field. It does have to be cropped, but it doesn't necessarily have to be corn. It can be wheat, it can be other stuff that's been cropped in the past. So when it comes to, there's also other programs with the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, and it's called the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, EQIP. And so they have pollinator plantings that they also do. It's not a um, long-term payment program. So it's going to be kind of a, you're provided cost share for this. And once it's planted, it's yours to enjoy, but you won't be getting payments on it in the future. That's, that's CRP. This is a bit different. Um, and then we also have the uh, Conser Conservation Stewardship Program, CSP. So this is gonna be kind of farm scale projects. You kind of enroll your home farm and there's different pollinator options that you can do as well as other soil conservation um, and, and ranching conservation focused projects. So that's kind of a few of the USDA federal programs that I work with here. Um, other stuff, I'm gonna move this over here. Some stuff that we have um, specific to Pheasants Forever that we're really excited about. This is a newer program. This is called our Pheasants Forever Pathways for Wildlife, and it has three components. It has a community habitat component that we work with. It has a grasslands component, and it also has a um, precision ag component that's focused more in the eastern part of the state looking at cover crops. So the one that I'm going to talk about the most, though, is our community habitat project. And so we provide 75% um, to 100% cost share to help with um, preparing uh, areas around towns for pollinator habitat. And so um, there's also sometimes money for boxes for bluebirds or swallows or other stuff as well. And it's just kind of a, we work with you to see what you're interested in and, and what we can do to help provide as much wildflower pollinator habitat on the landscape. And so, this is, this is a newer program that we're still trying to get out on the landscape. Um, COVID-19 kind of 
hit back. I wasn't able to get any community habitat stuff here in North Platte. I really would love to see it next year. A lot of the times when we're planting wildflower habitat, we'll do a dormant seeding as we call it. So we'll plant it in November through April and then the seeds can just come up when it's warm enough. And so um, unfortunately with COVID, we kind of weren't able to do a lot of that. But um, I'm excited to see more of this around town. You know, it doesn't, there's no you know, limit to the, to the how small your plot needs to be. If you just want to provide a pollinator garden, please get in contact with me. I'd love to talk about this program. Um, on some of our larger acreages, um, when we're looking at specifically pivots, we are going to be irrigated pivots, I should be saying. We're going to be looking at the Corners for Wildlife Project, which also focuses on planting, like I mentioned, wildflower uh, mixes. And um, there is cost share available. There's two options. We have like a grass option where you just plant grass and wildflowers, and we have a, a wildflowers and shrub option. And they come with different types of payments. And I should mention that um, when we're talking about the Corners for Wildlife, it is a five-year contract. And depending on what you are doing with your um, pathways for wildlife community habitat, it can be a one to three-year contract. And so you get cost share for planting and drilling the seed. And you also get cost share from us for, um, I should say, you also get a payment for several years. So please get in touch with me. Um, we love to see this. We've had a lot of success with the Corners for Wildlife and kind of pathways came as an alternative to areas that weren't adjacent to a pivot because that corners for wildlife is specific to areas near pivot corners. So um, that's our programs. Does anyone have any questions? I know it's a lot of information. Believe me, it took a bit to learn, but I'm happy to talk about it with anyone. Um, so there's a couple of questions. Um, Christy asks, should, um, I'm seeing paper tubes are getting wet. Should we be providing a roof over the tin can? That's for the B Hotel. Yeah, you can if you want, or you can, like I mentioned, I was gonna place mine on a deck that had a covering over the top. Um, I've seen people doing that. Um, it's really up to you what you think. A lot of times with these paper tubes, you're gonna wanna, instead of having them hanging out, these were just kind of new ones that I made, you're gonna wanna actually cut them so that they're interior. So that can help too. And if you, and you, you tip it just slightly, that would help keep, you know, these are gonna pa be packed in tight, so they're not gonna be flying out, but that would help any moisture getting in. Um, as long as they think it's not constantly getting rained on every single day, um, if you're out here in the western part of the state, we should probably be fine with the mold, but um, if you wanna do a roof, you can. Okay. Um, and then, um, how long should the paper be hotel tubes be? Yeah, so, um, you should probably be doing at least four and a half, usually if you can, six inches. Um, a lot of these cans are not six inches. I did find a few that were, um, but the longer the better because the female, when those females go and lay eggs, they, um, if they're not long enough, they don't lay, they like lay a specific number of male and female eggs, especially with paper bees. So you want it, the longer the better so they can lay both male and female eggs. So if you can, um, four and a half to six inches longer. I think uh, the, diagram earlier in the PowerPoint presentation um, talked about drilling the smaller holes like five to three inches so that kind of gives you an idea and every species is going to have a different length that they prefer and how long that they need. Mm. Um, and then Christine asks um, so federal f programs are available nationwide? The federal yeah. Yes they are and uh, they might differ in the practices that are available with each state. Um, but generally speaking, there are they are available nationwide um, for people to go in and talk to their NRCS office or a biologist in, in, the, in the NRCS office or even just um, a farm service agency. Not all states have biologists in the NRCS offices. Um, this is kind of a partnership with, um, with you know, Pheasants Forever and NRCS. So some states don't, a lot of them do. Pheasants Forever has, has really grown in the past year with these partnerships and it's been, and it's been great to see. Um, and usually if you can go online and look at the USDA website, you can kind of find information out about that. Okay. Um, and then Jan um, said, if you had a bee hotel without any inserts, should you bring the hotel in and keep it in a cardboard box with, 
with holes during the winter and then put it out in the spring. Yeah, so what you're gonna do is if you, um, let's say that I um, put this out and there was only one that was kept that showed that a female had gone and laid eggs and there's larvae in there that are developing into little mason bees. What I would do is I'd come and I'd just pull that insert out and put it in a cardboard box or put it in a, um, a paper bag inside a cardboard box even. Or if you wanted, you could just bring this inside, put it in an actual cardboard box that has holes and then leave it over winter and then put it back out. Um, if you didn't want to pull out the tube or do anything different. Once you see that this is open and they've emerged, they've left that, you can then pull that out um, and put a new one in and then set this out so that other species can use it. Um, if, if your chances are not all of your, um, well, it's possible all of your holes are going to get used, but it's possible they might not. So that's just something to keep an eye out for. Did that help answer that question? Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think that's all the questions we have for right now. Alrighty, so I'm just gonna, I think we're almost at the end here. Uh, yep, so here is a, so we're in Nebraska, so this is kind of a list of the different types of biologists that we have in offices across the state. We cover quite a big area and we have really grown in the past few years. Um, these partnerships started in early 2000 and as you can see, they we have covered an enormous area. We have both farm bill wildlife biologists and then higher ups, we do have coordinating wildlife biologists. And um, if you have specific questions that you're trying to ask about what you should plant in your pollinator garden or what type of um, you know, practices that might be available, I would definitely get in contact with any of these individuals. They are a great team, excited to help, love, love to work with people, and they're, and they're just really, really great at their jobs. Um, I should mention, yeah, we provide technical assistance to a variety of stakeholders. We are also a partnership with Nebraska Game and Parks and a, and a number of other partners. Um, but Nebraska Pheasants Forever has just a, done a wonderful job of working on the landscape. And we have recently this year reached in our six millionth acre. So we have in some way, shape or form gone out and helped improve CRP native grass or, or implement even CRP on the landscape, over 6 million acres in Nebraska alone. So as you can see, we're doing a lot of great stuff on the landscape. Um, if anyone's interested in joining Pheasants Forever, you know a lot of our, some of our habitat um, work actually comes from our chapter programs and it is directly related to our members. So if anyone's interested in joining, please let me know and I can help you know get an application together. Um, it's a great group of people and um, yeah, we're doing a lot of great work in Nebraska, keeping wildlife on the landscape, keeping opportunities for future generations, not just with bluebirds and pollinators, but also with pheasants and quail, so. And with that, I will say thank you to Conservation Nebraska for hosting this webinar. I'm really excited to get to work with Alicia. She's been great. I've worked with her in the past as well, and this was really fun to put together. Um, I can't stress enough the help from my coworkers, especially Holly Green, our communications person, as well as Heather Francis, the biologist in, down in uh, Imperial. They're both great people and, and super good people to bounce ideas off of and see what they've kind of done in the past. Um, anyone for participating in conservation programs that help our pollinators, help our bluebirds, help our wildlife, um, thank you so much for what you do. And all of the participants today, thank you so much for joining in. Any questions? So um, we did get a couple more questions. Sarah asked um, if I already have a bee hotel that's being utilized, but it's not in an optimal location, would moving it be de detrimental to the bees that are already starting to use it? Yes. Um, from what I understand, some species actually come and actually feed their babies after the fact, um, versus some of them cap it off. So I would just leave it for now. If it's not, even if it is not in the best location, you have them using it, which is wonderful. That's like great. So just leave it for now and then next year think about a better location and try to prepare it so that you know it's gonna be safe. Um, if you're concerned about rain or something, maybe even just taking a little piece of petal or something and putting it over the top or a little piece of wood to kind of keep the rain out would probably help. Okay, and then um, that was all. Thank you, Addie, so much for talking. That was a lot of great information that you gave us. Yeah, I'm not sure how much time I ran over, but I'm really happy. And uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to email me or um, give me a shout. I'm also happy to talk via phone. So thank you.